start with uh, measurements when it comes to assessment. Always starting with an assessment with clients is super important. Uh, you want to make sure you're looking at every single aspect of what may be going on with your body in respect to how they move, uh, their posture, how that posture relates to that movement. We go over primal movement patterns such as a push, a pull, a lunge. We look at spinal stability and joint quality or joint mobility. We put it all together at the end and kind of give a client idea as to what may be going on with their body. From there, we can create a good corrective exercise strategy or we can move more into performance style training. It all depends on how he scores in this particular assessment. Every client starts with this and it's usually free of charge. So, first thing we're going to do is we're going to get the measurement of your right arm, sir. So, we'll get you to lift the arm up. Yes, sir. Now, we'll get you to do that two times. So, we'll get you to drop your arm again. Lifting it up. One more time for me. Drop it down one more time. Centimeters, that's 84 centimeters. You got a long reach. So what we're going to get you to do is lift both your arms up. Men get a chest measurement. Women, not so much. centimeters. One boy's got some three trunk legs. And then finally the right down. But yeah, big numbers, 42 centimeters. So not always, but a lot of the time when we look at posture, it can relate or kind of tell us what we're going to do when we move. So we're going to analyze the posture here. We're talking about optimal posture. I don't want you to change it or anything like that. What people need to get in the habit of doing is having their feet over their shoulders. Their knees need to kick out at a fourth or fifth toe position. Okay, the pelvis in relation to optimal posture it needs to be in what we call a neutral position. For a lot of us, it ends up in a forward tilt or in a rare face face or very excessive posterior tilt. If you look at the shoulder blade position, it also needs to kind of lie beside the side of our thighs, okay? And our head position matters too. We want our head to kind of be back in line with everything. How often do you see people with optimal posture? Very few, maybe one in 10. And that can kind of uh, cause issues when they start moving. It can cause mechanical dysfunctions and movement problems. So we'll analyze Steven's posture here. If we look at his posture in particular, he's pretty good. What he started to get is a little bit of what we call that external bias. Okay, in an aggressive form of external bias, to see the feet coming out really aggressively and okay? they're not going to be able to load their hips properly and change direction in a good uh, position like that okay if we look at Stephen's lower back we're getting a little bit of what we call an excessive lordotic curve this happens a lot with people because of the fact we're always telling or moving forward okay but his isn't super aggressive if we look at his feet again they're not necessarily aligned so what can usually happen is you'll get a misalignment of the hips okay if we look at that position there he's got a little bit of shoulders in relation to his feet position okay but if we look at his arm position it's not necessarily creeping forward as much so that's a good thing he's got his hands back in line with kind of a front or the side part of his side they are starting to come forward a little bit but not excessively okay and finally at the last position for his head we want a good neutral position super important we find that people have an external bias and then an anterior bias will typically have a head drop position and that can put a lot of pressure into the traps, okay, into the joints in your thoracic spine, and into all the muscle attachments in here, which are responsible for focus, breathing, uh, unity, stuff like that. If you look at his head position, it's starting to come forward a little bit, but it's not excessive. Excessive would be about seven, eight, nine, ten centimeters, and so forth, where you're coming through. For every centimeter you're over that safe anterior threshold, 
average maybe five to seven centimeters of that anterior rotation, you can add up to 20 to 30 pounds of pressure, which obviously is gonna wear you out, get you headaches, not give you a lot of focus before and after your workout. We looked at his traps, he was doing a lot of overhead press in the last few days, they're very on fire. So we look at trying to release those tight components into his traps to help him kind of uh, be a lot more relaxed and get him more uh, ready to go for exercise, okay? So, in summary, if you look at that postural analysis, he's got a little bit of an external bias in his feet, which is causing a slight anterior rotation in his shoulders. Not excessive. Head position starting to come forward a little bit. All right. The next few tests we're going to do is going to test this joint integrity of your hips and your shoulders. So we're getting to lie down on this uh, one mat here on your back. as high as you can. When I put pressure on the leg, tell me where you feel the muscles activate. Where do you feel it activate? The quads? Quads, okay. We're gonna bring it out to the side a little bit. You're not gonna resist the side position. This is the global kind of representation of the same thing. Pull this up nice and strong. Tell me if you feel it any differently. The lateral component of this quad. So he's feeling more lateral. Some people may even feel it recruited a little bit in the hamstring. That's a little bit of dysfunction. Luckily for Steven here, he's moving well. He's feeling more of a lateral uh, reaction when he moves his leg out to the side. It makes sense. It's an abduction away from the center. Okay? Next test we're going to do is for joint integrity of the knee joints. We're going to to relax your leg completely. What we're looking for is if there's any type of laxity in this lower quadrant of his leg. If he's getting any type of bending component, when I put pressure right here at the ligament, he could be in trouble. He could have a ligament that's kind of loose, or he could have some muscles or attachments that are kind of loose there that could put him at risk for a knee injury. So we look at doing some knee rehabilitative work prior to getting into any explosive or performance training, okay? I'm gonna continue to get you to relax your leg. This is a passive range of motion test for the hip joint. We're gonna get him to move his leg in here, or I'm gonna move it for him. And what we're looking at is his ability to create external rotation in a passive sense. In relation to the midpoint, his hip goes out externally, even though the leg moving in this is an external test. And if we look at this, the optimal components for uh, external rotation should be about 90 degrees, and he's getting close somebody's lacking a lot of external rotation, like they're kind of stuck here, they're gonna recruit a lot of torque or a lot of kind of a hip extension, not necessarily to the hip, but usually recruited in the knee or the lower back, and they'll have a lower back issue. So it's super important to get that optimal capacity or that optimal range of motion, which is about 90 degrees. Obviously, he's got some room for improvements, and in the past, he's had issues with uh, injuries, you know, within the hip or in the lower back, so this kind of makes sense, okay? Now we're gonna look at internal rotation look at his internal rotation capacity. We want to get about 20 to 30 degrees and he's pretty much there. So he's not really having any restrictions in that internal rotation capacity. And remember, this is a passive test. We're going to do some other tests that he can actually actively try to recruit some of this. But in a passive sense, we kind of start painting a picture for us. Okay? So he's getting good internal rotation. He's lacking a little bit of external rotation. So we'll look at improving some of those capabilities because overall he wants to be optimal in both ranges of motion. That'll take pressures off of certain areas that he's overloading. Particularly, he's probably gonna overload his knee a little bit and again, the lower back, okay? Now we're gonna look at the shoulders. So we need to lift this arm up as high as you can. This is a joint integrity test for the shoulder joint. I'm gonna get you to push down towards your feet. Any pain in the shoulder joint, okay? I'm gonna get you to push up towards your head. Any pain? I'm gonna get you to push out towards me. Any pain? I'm gonna get you to point it towards your chest. Any pain, good. Now, if somebody has a really weak core, when they're using their extremities, in this case, their upper quadrant or their arm, when they go to push on that test, their body will move with the push. Steven didn't really have that, he stayed rather rigid. So there's a good chance that when we get into some core stability test, he has a pretty strong active core, okay? Again, we're also looking for if there's any type of pain there. If there's some pain there, there's obviously gonna be some type of rehabilitative or prehab workout that you'd wanna do prior to a workout with resistance. But he didn't have any of that, so good to go. Okay? Now we'll do the same test on the left leg. We'll speed up a bit. Okay, lift the 
left leg as high as you can. And then push on this quad. Does it feel any different? No? Okay, about the same recruitment. Excellent. We'll bring this out to the side. Oh, it's nice and strong. Same thing. Okay, good stuff. Get you to relax the leg completely. Any issues there? No laxity, so that's good. We'll get him to continue to relax the leg. And we will test it comparatively speaking to the other side. He's got about almost the same symmetry. Okay, that's very rare. Usually people have different uh, capabilities in their hip mobility. But if we look at his internal rotation, as you can see, he's a little more jammed up on this side. Okay, so definitely some areas where we're going to improve. He's not going to improve it by just simply doing mobility mechanics. He works a lot and he works out a lot, so there's a good chance that he needs to do some roll-up techniques prior to getting into mobility drills. There has to be a proper cycle of exercises together to really help him recruit or find new uh, ranges of motion and to be able to activate those muscle groups in those new ranges of motion. You'll never get it just by simply doing mobility drills. You have to combine it with some other drills that kind of release the tension, which is the roll-up drills. Okay, we're gonna look at this arm now. We can push down towards your feet. Any pain? Up towards your head. Any pain? Up towards me. Any pain? Up towards your chest. Excellent. So he's not getting any type of shoulder issues there. So that's good. So now we're going to flip you over. We're going to do the posterior stuff. Okay? Now I don't have any chiropractors or massage parlors bed, so we are just going to improvise. And we'll need some height for some of these tests. We'll need his calf all three. Make some notes and summarize what's going on with the anterior summary. So if you look at your hip, mobility is pretty good. But could use some more exterior rotation capabilities. If you want to compare the two hips, I'd say you have more hip range of motion in your right hip as opposed to your left hip, right, your right hand dominant. Yeah. So that makes sense. Usually you're going to be a lot more dominant on one side. It's going to be a little bit more mobility, a lot of more strength as well. Okay. Shoulders were integral, no pain in that test. Okay. Floor stayed rather rigid as well. This time we're going to get you to lie on your stomach. When you're lying on your stomach, these are going to be the posterior summary test. And actually, I'm going to have you place your hand beside your waist exactly like that. Okay, so you can assist or use any type of uh, cheating mechanism when you do these particular exercises. Now, we're going to start the same way we did with the right leg. We're going to get you to lift that right leg up as high as you can. And when I push on this, you're going to tell me where you feel it. Back. Okay, you feel in the hamstring. Do you feel it all in your butt? A little bit, not really. Yes, no, maybe yeah. so. Yeah, okay, it's good. Do you feel it on the same side of the back or the other side of the back? Uh, a little bit. A little bit on that side, that's good. And then finally, do you feel it in the obliques? Uh, yeah. You do. Awesome. Okay, so we're going to bring this leg out to the side. Same type of representation. And I'm going to get you to hold it up nice and strong. When I push on it, where do you feel it? Hamstring. Okay, do you feel it less in the glutes? Yes, okay. Do you feel it more on the same side of the back or the opposing side? Same? Same side of the back this time, okay? And then the obliques, do they turn on or off? On, okay, they're still on, that's good. All right, finally, I'll give you a quick break. The last test we're gonna do, we're gonna bend this leg up at 90 degrees, okay? And I'm gonna get you to lift this knee up off the ground. When I push on this, now where do you feel? Is it any different? Do you have recruitment in your quads now? A little bit, okay. More in the glutes or less? More? More? Good stuff. Do you have more on the hamstrings or less? Uh, a little bit. A little bit less? Less, yeah. Yeah? Same side of the back or opposing? Um, same. Okay, and then the obliques probably turned off. But not as strong. Okay, alright. So, even the rare case, what we'll be fine, what we mostly see when we do a test like this is there's a bit of a strength imbalance, okay? Or there's a bit of an activation imbalance because we always typically move forward. And when this is not really present, like he had the right muscle group present, his glutes were firing off, his hamstring was firing off, the opposing side of the back was firing off, his obliques were firing off. That is a particular muscle relationship 
that's super responsible for something that we do that's more intensive than say walking. We would run and these types of muscle groups need to activate to create a very healthy range of motion or gait pattern when we run. We find with people they don't have enough recruiting or strength or activation components in that particular area so their run patterns off and then when they need to change direction they need to squat and transfer weight or transition out of movement it's all overloading in certain areas you can imagine why people end up with knee problems groin problems back problems you name it it's all because of this particular muscle imbalance but steven's kind of a rare case all of the right muscle groups are firing off mind you when he curled the leg in when we brought the leg in he started to recruit a little bit through the quads. If everything was firing off completely well, he would actually get less quad activation, be more in the glutes, because he bent this in. Okay, now, again, most people aren't gonna get that. They're mostly gonna get either uh, a lot of lower back loading, their quads are gonna fire off, maybe their calves will fire off, and they typically won't have that opposing side of their back firing off. This is important, because if I don't have that type of component or that type of activation when I go to run, I may overload one side. This has to almost be a counterbalance to keep me in a linear fashion or keep me balanced. Okay, if you don't have this type of recruiting pattern, a lot of the times you can't distribute weight as well either, and that could also put you at risk. But again, he's kind of a rare case. Still, we talk about the tests overall and we compare the two. He's getting a little bit more strength on the anterior chain as opposed to the posterior chain. We put the same amount of pressure on his leg, but he wasn't as strong. He couldn't get it as high, and he was kind of starting to fatigue a little bit. So what would be most of the workouts that he would focus on, the posterior chain, especially off the start? We're gonna look at doing a lot of hip extension exercises in relation to keeping the lower back in a very neutral position, okay? So he's not overextending through his lower back. And if he keeps doing a lot of anterior chain work, it's just gonna create more of those postural imbalances. We would focus on trying to articulate or control those aspects of retraction and a neutral spine in the context of what he needs moving forward get his posture in a good position and to start activating the right muscle groups. Have these muscle groups almost stronger than the anterior chain. He's gonna use those muscles all the time. He needs to be able to recruit here and give himself more balance and it'll give him better weight distribution when he needs to transition and run and stuff like that, okay? Now, typically speaking, if you've never done a lot of rollouts, there's gonna be some pain in some of these areas. So if I put pressure in here, do you feel any pain? Not really. He's, again, a rare case. A lot of the time to do these tests that people are grimacing in pain, okay? Move pressure into the glutes. Not really, good stuff. Hamstrings, yeah, so the hamstrings are quite tight. Again, this would be where we would start off, trying to release those tissue with tissues to give them some more space or more suppleness into the tissues. And then if we look into the hip joint, yeah, it feels either ticklish or it hurts, it's kind of the same response. Hurts is just a little bit farther gone, okay? And now we've explained what's going on with this particular segment. Let's go through the left side a little bit faster. We can lift the left leg as high as you can. See if it recruits a little bit differently. So if I push down on that, where do you feel it? Uh, Hamstring less than the glute on this side? Uh, yeah. yeah, less, I think. You just tell by the way you're kind of producing the movement. We're going to bring this out to the side, holding it nice and strong. Yeah. Where do you feel it there? Uh, same on the side there. Yeah, less than the glutes, I imagine? Yeah. Yeah, this feels a little bit weaker than the other side. Good. And then finally, get you to bend it up at 90 degrees. I think 90, no more than that. And we'll get you to lift it up. Okay, in the quad. So you recruit a little bit more on the quad side on this side. Okay, so obviously some asymmetries there, which can lead to problems moving forward if it kind of doesn't shore up the activation point. Good, you can relax, do a touch test. Maybe there's more pain in this particular area. Do you feel anything? A little bit, yeah. More in there, no? Okay. Hamstrings, oh yeah, he's, he's grimacing a bit. Okay, and then finally into the hip joint. He's got some issues, okay? So definitely that would be where we would start. If he walks in off the street and he's got these issues present, did he not add impact into his movements as he walked into the street? Did he not add impact when he changed and walked over to this particular area? Absolutely. So that he would want to start his warm-ups with literally releasing the tissue with issues. Okay, he wants to break down those adhesions, get those areas a lot more supple and get more response or oxygen or nutrients in there. It's gonna come from the rollout technique. Okay, and then he'd get into dynamic mobility to help promote better mobility without any pain or any bad pain. Okay? Alright, so the reason why we needed all three of these mats was because we needed height for your upper body for these tests. So what we're going to do is three tests. The first one you're going to do with your face straight ahead, so you may have to take off your hat. 
we're going to lift our arms up as high as we can. We're going to do a test of three reps, just so we can uh, get a bit of an average on how much uh, mobility you're getting overhead. Now, it's important that you're only lifting your arms in this movement, okay? One thing I'm going to give you a tip on, and this is a big tip that I give people, is you're going to actually stabilize the shoulder joint by doing one simple thing. Instead of lifting your hands up like this, you're going to turn your thumbs towards the ceiling the same test, okay? Typically speaking, unless I'm loading some type of weight, you're good, one more. I wanna have that type of position, it stabilizes the shoulder girdle, okay? As soon as the hand sits up here and I'm used to recruiting into this type of position, it's unstable. So it's better to have it kind of turning back, okay? So overall, his overhead mobility wasn't too bad. Next test we're gonna do, you're gonna put your arms at a T position. high as you can, keeping your face into the mat, unfortunately. Good, and let it down. What you'll typically see when people do this test is they're actually gonna start recruiting into the lats. We wanna actually test the upper quadrant or the upper delts, okay? With the lats assisting. The lats will take over because we're a bigger muscle group and people are used to being in that kind of collapsed position. So they have to work on just building retraction in the upper portion. They can't recruit into the lats. Luckily, Steven doesn't do that. So we'll get you to do two more. Good. One more. Excellent. So he's also getting pretty good mobility in that area, good activation. The last one, which is probably the most important, we're going to place your hands beside our waist, palms up towards the ceiling. We're going to see how Steven's able to recruit his lower trap retraction. Now this is super important and able to stabilize the joint to get my body in a very strong fixed position and keep it grounded and to create potential power out of a movement when I'm kind of at a base of support, okay? It's really important for your deadlifts and squats to have that proper retraction in the shoulder blades so they don't sit out and you end up overloading the front part of your body. So this is a super important test. We're gonna see how much recruitment Steven gets out of that shoulder girdle, sorry, or the lower traps, I should say. So I'm gonna get you to squeeze your shoulder blades back as far as you can, okay? Good, and then let it go. Okay, you need two more. Now, he's really good at it. He gets a lot of retraction. What you'll typically see with people with bad posture is they don't even know how to recruit that area. It's almost too atrophied. It's been latent for so long, and they just don't simply have enough strength. These are the people that may be in danger of a shoulder injury, a lower back injury, groin injuries, knee injuries, you name it. Okay? Good. You stand up. So overall, his posture, Jane, he's rare. He gets a lot of proper recruiting uh, muscle groups or muscle relationships but this is very rare. You're not normally gonna see this. This is why we have to test, because it can start painting a picture as to why people are getting pain with certain movements. Usually speaking, because of bad posture, they don't recruit in the right areas, and from that component, when they go to do movements, a lot of their front part of their muscle groups are overloaded, and they just simply get exhausted, and then when they need to change direction, they're at risk for pulling or uh, ripping or tearing something, okay? And over time, that accumulates. So it's super important to get to this type of and luckily for Steven's case, he's getting that. Stay tuned for the next part of our assessment.